Good afternoon and welcome to our event, Criminalizing Migration and Indefinite Detention, Chinese at Angel Island in the McNeil Island Prison with Professor Elliot Young. Before we begin, let me say that there's live captioning available if you locate the button on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. We'll begin with a land acknowledgement. We take a moment to recognize that Berkeley sits on the territory of Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chechenyo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Muwekma Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the, since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold the University of California, Berkeley, more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. My name is Letty Volp. I'm the director of the Center for Race and Gender here at UC Berkeley. And we are thrilled that you can be with us, with us for today's event, which is the second of three public lectures forming the Center for Race and Gender's Angel Island Forum series. The series was designed to accompany the campus-wide project, A Year on Angel Island, organized by the Arts and Design Initiative and the Future Histories Lab. Our first speaker in the series was Professor Erica Lee, and today's event will be followed by another public lecture, February 23rd, by Professor Nyan Shaw on bodily defiance and immigration detention. Many thanks to the Berkeley Interdisciplinary Migration Initiative for co-sponsoring these events. Let us now hear from our uh, featured speaker who I'm going to introduce. I am thrilled that we get to hear today from Professor Elliot Young. Professor Young is a professor of history at Lewis and Clark College and a renowned expert on the long history of migrant mobility, criminalization, and detention in the Americas. Professor Young is the author of three books, Alien Nation, Chinese Migration in the Americas from the Cooley Era through World War II, Carolino Garza's Revolution on the Texas-Mexico border, and most recently, this book, Forever Prisoners, How the United States Made the World's Largest Immigrant Detention System, published in 2021 by Oxford University Press. Um, I could read to you what Professor Erica Lee says about this book, as Professor Lee wrote a blurb, Quote, we have long needed a history of immigrant detention and forever prisoners delivers. Drawing on archival documents, as well as his own experience as an expert witness in recent asylum cases, Young brilliantly continues the dismantling of America's nation of immigrants myth and instead shows how our long history of criminalizing migration has led us to build the world's largest system for imprisoning immigrants, a nation of immigrant prisons. This is an essential read for anyone invested in building a more just society, close quote. Professor Young is also the co-founder of the Te Potslan Institute for Transnational History of the Americas and is the founder of the Migration Scholar Collaborative, a hub for scholars sharing work with the public with the aim of decriminalizing migration and opening wider pathways to legal immigration in the United States. He has also served as co-chair of the Portland Committee on Community Engaged Policing and as an expert witness for over 500 asylum cases for refugees fleeing Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Venezuela, and Cuba. Professor Young will begin with a lecture and then there will be an opportunity for Q&A. Please post your question or comment into the Q&A button on the bottom of the screen. Without further, I do let me turn it over to Professor Young. Thank you. Thank you, Letty, and thanks, Ariana, for organizing behind the scenes and for inviting me to this talk. I'm, I'm honored to be presenting along with um, my colleagues, Erica Lee and Nayan Shaw. And I'm very glad that uh, Professor Lee preceded me, and I'm sure she delved deeply into the history of Angel Island specifically. 
What I want to talk about today is a little bit adjacent to Angel Island and in some senses preceded it. And it what it's what went on at a different prison to the north of San Francisco, off the coast of Tacoma, Washington, McNeil Island prison, where Chinese were held on immigration charges in the late 1880s, well before Angel Island opened. So I'm gonna just share my screen and then you could see some slides as we go along. So by the time of the Trump administration, the United States locked up more than half a million foreigners every year for immigration related offenses. At its height in 2019, more than 50,000 immigrants, men, women, and children were being caged in hundreds of ICE detention facilities on any given day. It took more than a century for the laws to be developed and the infrastructure created to lock up so many immigrants. And Angel Island certainly stands as one of the hubs of that early history of incarceration. But even before 1910, when Angel Island was opened, Chinese were being caged in warehouses on docks in San Francisco, and more systematically at a prison off the coast of Washington state. This slide, um, the Chinese must go, is comes from one of the purges that happened in Tacoma, which is a few miles from where McNeil Island prison stands. So in the mid 1880s, Chinese were being purged in pogroms from towns up and down the Pacific coast, including into Canada. These were spurred on by angry white working class mobs and government officials who feared economic competition and who viewed Chinese as a danger to the purity of America as a white ethno state. This poster from Tacoma, Washington from 1885 illustrates the anti-Chinese sentiment led by the mayor himself. In the wake of those pogroms, increasing numbers of Chinese were being picked up for unauthorized presence in the country and sent to the remote McNeil Island Federal Penitentiary off the coast of Seattle or Tacoma, closer to Tacoma. McNeil Island was set up as a jail in 1875, but a decade later, it became the center of efforts to enforce Chinese exclusion by locking up Chinese laborers who had entered without authorization. Judges invoked the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, the first piece of federal immigration restrictionist legislation, but they were sentencing the Chinese to six months of hard labor at the prison. This imposition of a criminal penalty for unauthorized presence in the country set off a debate about the legality of migrant detention that ultimately reached the US Supreme Court. The 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act had made it a misdemeanor punishable by imprisonment up to five years for those who forged certificates of identification. Section 10 of the um, act provided for seizure of ships for refusing to abide by the strict requirements to report all Chinese passengers on their manifest. Section 11 of the act stipulated that those who helped to smuggle unauthorized Chinese into the country could be fined up to $1,000 and a year in prison. The only consequence, and it was still a major one for Chinese found to be unlawfully in the country was that they would be deported at the US government expense. Two years later, however, in 1884, the act was amended to include section 16, making any violation of the provisions of, the, um, of the, this act, a misdemeanor punishable by a fine of up to $1,000 and or imprisonment of up to a year. Um, so that's the 1884 amendment. It's not clear if the vague provision was intended to criminalize Chinese found in the country without authorization, but the US attorney in Washington territory used this provision for just that purpose. In 1892, a new provision, section four, mandated that Chinese who were found unlawfully in the country could be imprisoned for up to one year at hard labor. So in the five years between 1887 and 1892, 243 Chinese were imprisoned on the island, almost all of them for illegal immigration or smuggling. 
their sentences ranged from six months to an indeterminate period, and they served between one month and two and two and a half years. Thus began the criminalization of migration in the United States. Up to 1892, Chinese at McNeil were mainly charged with unlawful presence or violation of Restriction Act. After that point, they were charged with more specific violations, including smuggling and forgery, but unlawful presence disappeared completely as a charge. So over time, charges would vary as new laws were passed, but the government always had a vast array of tools by which to imprison unauthorized migrants. And this um, document that you're seeing now is one of those uh, sentences for people to be committed to McNeil Island for six months um, for being uh, unlawfully in the United States. These are some of the images that were taken of um, the mugshots of Chinese who were at McNeil Island. And it's an incredible source that in the absence of much documentary evidence of the lives of these Chinese, we at least have these photographs um, of them, although in this very uh, uh, difficult position of being in prison. So after their six month punishment had expired, the US government marshals attempted to return Chinese at McNeil Island prison to Canada from whence they came. And that was the language of the Chinese Exclusion Act. So ever since this act prohibited the entry of Chinese laborers, Chinese used either Canada, Mexico, or Cuba as springboards to enter the US clandestinely. So they would enter through those other countries and then cross the border um, clandestinely as a way to get into the United States. In one instance, the US Marshal marched the Chinese to the boundary line with Canada and ordered them to keep going. And what he, uh, one of the um, reports about this said, the United States Customs Officer at Semiahmu explained to the Chinamen that they must not come back to this side or the next time they would lose their cues. The Chinese seemed glad to get out of custody, and the last we saw of them, they were going down the road toward New Westminster on a dog trot, chattering like a lot of parrots. So this description by the marshal revealed the informality, the brutality, and illegality of these informal deportations. Essentially, the marshal was forcing the Chinese to return to Canada illegally by clandestinely pushing them across the international border. One explanation is that these early deportations were improvised by local officials who had no guidance or precedent to follow. However, this case shows that the policy was designed and approved by the US Secretary of State and the Attorney General. The threat to cut off the cues and references to the chattering like a lot of parrots highlights the racist discrimination faced by Chinese, particularly on the West Coast. However, Canada had also established its own restrictions against the Chinese, a head tax required to be paid by every Chinese entrant. And so when the Chinese brought by the marshals could not pay the head tax, the Canadians refused their entry and the Chinese were sent back to McNeil. And they faced their indefinite detention. US Attorney White pleaded with the State Department and Congress and he said, Relieve us from this difficulty. The penitentiary will soon be overflowing with contraband Chinamen. The legal and moral quandary this posed was daunting. As the subject stand, now stands, he wrote, they are subject to indefinite imprisonment. So for years, scores of Chinese were being piled up at McNeil Island while the government figured out what to do with them. And it's important to remember, even though the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed in 1882, the government didn't really have the infrastructure either legally or in terms of um, detention places to know what to do with people who were pending deportation. On June 18, 1889, Washington Territory Supreme Court Justice Cornelius Hanford complained directly to Benjamin Harrison, President Benjamin Harrison, about 19 Chinese who had been arrested in October of 1887 
and two years later still languished on McNeil Island. For Hanford, deportation was acceptable, but incarceration was not. As he said, it is contrary to the fundamental law of this nation that any being should be subjected to repeated imprisonments amounting to perpetual car incarceration for not doing that which he is powerless to do. In other words, um, leaving the country, uh, going to Canada was not possible. Nonetheless, Hanford refused to hear their cases and instead issued another writ of deportation. The Washington justice wrote that he did not presume to tell the president how to act, but he pleaded with him to intervene in this case to avoid the embarrassment of territory officials and to, as he put it, set at liberty 19 poor, miserable, captive strangers. Finally, in 1890, the first deportations of Chinese back to China began from McNeil Island, sparking what would become more than 130 years of detentions and deportations. While there is no record of major protests by the Chinese in the prison, Chinese complained about their conditions of their incarceration, and at least one Chinese man attempted to commit suicide and later escaped. Several Chinese also died while awaiting deportation at McNeil Island, their last days on earth spent behind bars. So that's the sort of local story of what's going on at McNeil Island, but the legal story is a broader one that um, impact, impacted not only Chinese uh, migrants everywhere in the United States, but comes to impact all uh, immigrants to the United States to this day. There are a host of other thorny questions that needed to be worked out, including what legal rights detainees had while awaiting deportation. The right of the state to det detain someone while awaiting deportation was held as an invi inviolable right of sovereignty in Fang Wei Ting, the 1893 court decision, and in Wang Wing in 1896. In Fang Wei Ting, the court ruled that deportation should not be considered a punishment, and therefore there was no requirement for a jury trial. In the Wang Wing decision, the Supreme Court again reaffirmed the right of the state to deport and to detain someone while ascertaining whether the person had a right to be in the country, but it also limited the conditions of imprisonment. The court argued that the case raised serious constitutional issues, including Fifth Amendment due process rights the Sixth Amendment's guarantee of a jury trial. Given that Wang Wing was sentenced to hard labor without the benefit of a jury trial or due process required by a criminal conviction, the court found the punishment to be unconstitutional. The government had the right to sentence a non-citizen to hard labor, the court opined, but not without the benefit of a judicial trial. Since hard labor was always reserved for quote unquote infamous crimes, giving a migrant such a sentence without a trial violated the constitution. As the court wrote, to declare unlawful residence within the country to be an infamous crime punishable by deprivation of liberty and property would be to pass out of the sphere of constitutional legislation unless provision were made that the fact of guilt should first be established by a judicial trial. So in this very important decision, the court affirmed the absolute right of the state to deport and detain a non-citizen, but it also established limits on the harshness of detention for non-citizens who had not had a judicial trial. And in doing this, the Supreme Court put its stamp of approval on the criminalization of Chinese by creating a legal fiction wherein their detention was not considered imprisonment in a legal sense. Nonetheless, US immigrant inspectors were constantly frustrated by their inability to punish immigrants with lengthy prison terms and the ease with which deported migrants returned to the United States across the border. So if they were, if they were able to be kicked out to Mexico or Canada, they could very easily in those days without a militarized border simply cross the border again. So facing that situation in 1907, the immigrant inspector Marcus Braun recommended making illegal immigration a felony. And here we see sort of 
a presage of what would l later come to be a major part of enforcement that we have today of um, felony convictions for, um, for illegal entry. And what Marcus Braun suggested in 1907 was, do not deport the Chinese caught to be unlawfully within our jurisdiction. Have the law amended and put the Chinamen in prison, make it a felony to come into the United States clandestinely, put him in prison to earn his passage home, and after having spent two, three, or more years in prison, deport him with the money he earned in the workhouse. Heeding Braun's advice, finally, in 1929, Congress stepped in once again to criminalize unauthorized entry as a misdemeanor offense and unauthorized re-entry as a felony. And the criminalizing of unauthorized Chinese migration in the 1880s and early 1890s presaged what would happen then in the 1930s and beyond when now Mex increasingly Mexicans were being criminalized for migrating. So in this period, Mexicans accounted for 85 to 99% of such prosecutions. So if we turn to the kind of criminal charges that the Chinese at McNeil Island faced, um, we could see that, um, and who was ended up in McNeil Island. McNeil Island was perhaps the most cosmopolitan locale on the West Coast at the time, featuring people from over 70 different countries as well as those born throughout the United States. They were sent to McNeil from the entire length of the Pacific coast, from Los Angeles, California, all the way up to Anchorage, Alaska. Considering that the total foreign born population on the Pacific coast from 1900 to 1930 was between 18 and 23%, an astonishing 29% of people locked up at McNeil Island from that, in that period were foreign born. Even more dramatically, in the decade between 1887 and 1896, 54%, more than half of those imprisoned at McNeil Island were foreign born. So McNeil Island was a federal penitentiary, and this may help to explain the disproportionate number of foreigners as immigration violations obviously fell under federal jurisdiction. Nonetheless, these statistics show that immigrant in incarceration was not ancillary to federal prisons, but in fact was the main purpose in their early years. So looking at these charts, um, we could see from 1887 to 1939, Mexicans were the largest group of foreign born people comprising 19%. Next, Chinese comprised 18%. Canadians were the third largest group making up 11% of the foreign born. The presence of these three groups at McNeil is disproportionate to their representation in the general population of the West Coast states from which they were drawn. Although the numbers of Europeans from individual countries was not significant, together Europeans made up 35% of the foreign born people. So that's who was in um, incarcerated at McNeil Island. If we look at the charges that they incurred, we could see that a dramatic shift occurred in the kinds of charges Chinese received in the late 19th century compared to the period from the 1920s onward. Whereas almost all Chinese were held at McNeil for quote unquote, being in the US unlawfully or violation of the Restriction Act from 1887 through 1892. After that year, Chinese were charged increasingly with drug and alcohol crimes unlawful presence completely disappeared as a charge after 1892. From, therefore, from 1893 to eight, 1939, only 6% of Chinese charges were immigration related. But after 1921, almost every Chinese at McNeil faced a charge of violating the Harrison Narcotic Act or other drug acts. So what this shows is that new laws uh, created new opportunities for criminalizing Chinese and other foreigners. When they were able to be incarcerated, they were incarcerated under immigration charges. And then um, when that became more difficult, they simply turned to drug charges to lock them up. And if we look um, at who the charges for other people locked up at McNeil, we could see that drug and alcohol 
crimes accounted for 40% of the crimes committed by foreign born people at McNeil. And that's roughly divided equally between uh, drugs and alcohol. Opium smuggling and violations for marijuana and other narcotics accounted for most of the drug charges, while violation of the pro of prohibition and the charge of selling liquor to Indians made up most of the alcohol related crimes. The large number of immigrants locked up for violation of drug and alcohol related crimes suggests that they were disproportionately targeted for enforcement. The second most frequent crime accounting for 21% of the charges was simply for being in the country unlawfully. So immigration related charges, including smuggling of aliens accounted for another 3% and white slavery for another 4%. White slavery linked immigration control to ideas about moral purity by criminalizing the transport of women who engaged in sex work or were believed to have been trafficked for quote unquote, immoral purposes. Many of the people imprisoned for unlawful president at McNeil might have been held pending deportation rather than serving specific criminal sentences. If we look at other kinds of charges, we find that property crimes like robbery, larceny, motor vehicle theft made up less than 4% of the total and violent crimes were a very small proportion of the rest of the charges, murder accounting for less than 1%. So these are probably things which we're familiar with that reflect present day mass incarceration. And what it shows is that even in this early 20th century, drugs, alcohol, and immigration charges accounted for more than two thirds of the charges against the foreign born at McNeil Island. Um, the significance of drug, alcohol, and immigration related charges, especially for Mexicans and Chinese, suggests that these groups were being targeted for enforcement. And this chart shows you the, um, different charges that different, these different three different groups um, had. These three kinds of offenses made up a majority of the charges for the three largest groups of foreign born inmates. But as you could see, Chinese and Mexicans were far more likely than Canadians to be charged with these violations. Almost all Chinese and Mexicans were in McNeil for either immigration or drug and alcohol violations while only about half of the incarcerated Canadians were locked up for these reasons. The data also reveals that Mexicans were charged more frequently with immigration related offenses, while Chinese were charged with drug and alcohol violations. Although this is just one snapshot of a penitentiary over a 50 year period, the data shows that the federal prison was being used far more frequently to lock up non-white foreigners for victimless offenses than to punish these, those people for violent crimes. Although the intake list for McNeil do not note race, the prison inmate magazine, The Island Lantern, published monthly census information about inmates in 1928 and 29. And from that data, we could get a sense of the so-called race of the people there. And some of these categories don't really make sense because military is listed as a race, um, but this is what uh, was included in that publication. So the snapshots uh, of the prison population show that even as the, the, there were sizable numbers of Chinese, Japanese, Mexicans, and quote unquote colored people at McNeil in the late 1920s, well over 70% of the inmates were considered white. Although the prison does not define what is meant by white, the other categories suggest that all people of European descent were inc included in that category. So now if we bring this story back to Angel Island, um, ships left San Francisco more frequently for China than from Tacoma, but immigration officers in San Francisco faced other obstacles such as being forced to release incoming Chinese pending their hearings. In San Francisco, officials complained that Chinese would routinely claim US birth or residency upon arrival. If denied entry, their lawyers would fight, file writs of habeas corpus and the judge would issue bail so they could be dis discharged while their cases were pending. 
1887, an examiner for the Justice Department found that the habeas proceedings in San Francisco were, quote, tinctured with fraud and, quote, corrupt court officials who earned large sums of money by processing hundreds of Chinese petitions every quarter. So the problem these immigration officials faced was that many of the Chinese simply skipped bail and disappeared if they lost in court. The collector of customs and special assistant U.S. attorney investigated the records of the district and circuit courts and found that 119 habeas cases involving Chinese had resulted in a deportation order that had not yet been executed. So after several notices, just 40 of those Chinese were remanded to the court, but the fact that the majority were still missing suggests that it was difficult for them to enforce Chinese exclusion without incarcerating the Chinese while their cases wound their way through the courts. Such a conclusion, of course, meant that Chinese fighting deportation would end up spending much more time behind bars. The question raised, therefore, in the late 1880s due to the Chinese at McNeil Island prison of how long a non-citizen could be detained while awaiting deportation was still not clarified in the early 20th century. In general, the rules governing deportation required the government to hold non-citizens for no longer than six months, but they allowed the state to keep them longer if they could not deport within that time limit. And so this situation that they found themselves in San Francisco helps explain the impetus to finally build and open Angel Island in 1910. The longest detention at Angel Island extended for almost two years when a Chinese woman was held on suspicion that she was being brought into the country for quote unquote immoral purposes. After filing three appeals on her behalf, asserting that she was the wife of a Chinese merchant, her attorney was finally successful in August 1918 in gaining her release. One Chinese man, Edgar Yuen Fong, had his deportation ca case drag on for 21 years. Um, and those of you who are lawyers or familiar with the asylum process know that today, given the over 2 million case backlog, many asylum cases are dragging on for three, four or more years. So this case dragged on for 21 years from 1918 until he was finally deported after exhausting his appeals in 1939. Although it appears from the criminal docket, he was out on bail for most of that time. He was in de detention in Ellis Island in December, 1936 and remained in custody until his deportation more than two years later. The lengthiest and ultimately unsuccessful deportation that is on record was against Carlos Marcello a Sicilian mob boss, limped along from 1953 until he was finally sentenced to 17 years in prison in 1982 for conspiring to bribe a U.S. District Court judge. Mar Marcello died in 1993 in New Orleans, having successfully fought his deportation for over 40 years. So that case dragged on, but ultimately the authorities were never able to grab him. However, beyond these extraordinary cases, thousands of Chinese and others were imprisoned for months at a time on immigration charges and then deported. After 1910, Angel Island became the primary site of Chinese migrant detention. And by the beginning of the 20th century, immigrants were a growing piece of the carceral system and over 100,000 foreign born people were locked away in jails, prisons, and insane asylums each year. So I want to take that historical story and bring it up to the present. Um, and in the last few years, an intrepid group of federal defenders, along with the help of historians such as Kelly Lytle Hernandez at um, UCLA and Debbie Kang at the University of Virginia, have challenged the constitutionality of the law that was passed in 1929, which criminalized illegal entry. And um, for 
those who follow these things closely, this 1325, 1326, um, those two laws uh, account for the majority of federal, accounted for the majority of federal prosecution. So essentially in recent years, the entire federal judicial system has been mobilized and weaponized to um, criminalize and, um, and to incarcerate uh, immigrants charged with illegal entry or re-entry. But in the summer of 2021, a uh, year and a half ago, a Nevada federal district court judge finally ruled that the illegal reentry charge was unconstitutional. And the reasoning was that it is based in racial animus. And to get at that reasoning required this historical argument going back to 1929 and understanding the context of the legislators who passed this, um, this particular provision, and then showing in each subsequent reenactment of the, um, of the Immigration Act that there was continuing racial animus. So for instance, in the 1950s, when the McCarran-Walter Act was passed and this uh, criminalization of migration was incorporated, they, in the legislative debates, Mexicans were routinely referred to with the derogatory term wetback, which the court noted was obvious sign of their racism. So you could see it in the language they use. You could also see it in terms of the enforcement against whom detention and deportation lands. And it almost entirely um, detention and deportation lands on uh, Latino individuals from um, Mexico and Central America, um, overwhelming proportion of people. Uh, after that case was decided in Nevada, the Biden administration appealed the ruling the next day and the Ninth District Court has heard the arguments but has not yet ruled on, on that particular case. Even if the Ninth District um, does, concurs and decides that this um, charge is unconstitutional, it's very unlikely given the Supreme Court we have today that, um, that they will concur with that. And so th there's a legal challenge to this criminalization of migration, which is valiantly making the effort to um, use the history to argue um, for the racism of that um, past history. But I think there's also uh, lots of other people working outside of the legal system to try to raise awareness um, of this history of criminalization and make the argument that people should not be criminalized for the simple act of migration. So um, this talk and research comes out of um, the book Forever Prisoners that Letty had mentioned. Um, and I just wanted to, to mention that um, to give a context for that. But I will stop my screen share and I'm happy to answer any questions or any comments you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful uh, to hear. Um, I really appreciate the linking of this historical period with the question that's on the table right now, pending before the Ninth Circuit. How do we think about the criminalization of illegal entry and reentry as a racial project? Um, but let me remind those of you who are listening to this uh, on the webinar, there's a Q&A button and please post any uh, questions or comments for Professor Young. Um, I'm gonna get started by saying how you think about trying to do what some might call a history from below when you're looking through the eyes of the state. And so I found your use of the photographs taken at McNeil Prison just so, um, poignant and intense and, and kind of the way to try to discern uh, the lives of people who are being like literally looking through the eyes of the state. Um, so, and I'm, I'm sure you've given this a lot of thought. I know that um, in this book as a whole, um, uh, those of us who've had a chance to read more of the book for 
more recent histories where you have access to the stories of um, individuals who are still alive, it's just like unbelievably compelling and moving uh, to hear you know, their narrative of, of what's been happening to them in this system of immigration prison. Um, but if you could say more about how you as a historian try to tell history about uh, people whose lives are difficult to access other than through the eyes of the government. Yeah, it's a sort of methodological problem that historians face. The archive <coughs> is set up, most archives are set up by the government, so they record the government's perspective. You can, on occasion, have the voices of um, people like Chinese immigrants come through in court transcripts um, and other places, but those are a lot of times those are highly mediated, like any court transcript. Um, you're not getting uh, access really into people's lives. And so it is, um, what I try to do in the book is a lot of immigration history is written with a lot of references to legislation and a lot of data. There's lots of numbers and graphs and charts, and I'm guilty of some of that. But what I try to do in the book is have that context, but then in each of the chapters, talk about stories of individual groups or individuals when I can, because I think that really to communicate the, um, the depth of the experience of being in detention and um, being deported, one needs to sort of understand that stories on an individual basis. So as you said, for some of the other chapters, which are about Japanese, Latin Americans who were kidnapped from Peru during the Second World War and brought to the United States to be put in immigrant detention and then exchanged for US um, prisoners held by the Axis powers, that follows a, a particular family. There's a story about a Salvadoran woman who came to this country when she was five years old um, and ends up getting deported um, uh, for a hot check, uh, fraudulent check charge um, in, and ha having to be separated from her three US citizen children. So all of those stories, I think, help to fill in the gaps for the Chinese in this period, unfortunately, the archive um, and the McNeil Island records had no information besides these statistical like logs of the Chinese who were brought in. And but they did have this record of the photographs. And so the I tried to use the photographs as a way of seeing them and trying to interpret and I think you know if I was an art historian I would probably be better at doing this and it made me a little uncomfortable to kind of read into images and try to discern what's going on um, because obviously the context of those photographs it's not someone taking their own portrait there it's like within it's part of this carceral logic and carceral technology and yet um, using those photographs I think you can hopefully get a better sense of their their humanity and them as individual individual people. Um, but I think, you know, much more can be done. There's always more in the archives and more stories that can be unearthed. And I think that that's really the job of historians is to, even when, you know, people say there's, you can't find it. If you look, uh, especially people who have the language skills, um, to read Cantonese, you know, um, looking at community archives, looking at other alternative archives as a way to, to tell those stories, I think is crucial. Fantastic. Um, the questions are piling in. So uh, without further ado, I will start reading some of them. Um, thank you for, this is Jacqueline uh, Messiani. Thank you for your presentation and the information shared. Are incarcerated people included in the census? If so, what transparency does that provide? Yeah, so there are um, census records of incarcerated people. Um, it, in the period that I'm looking at, it does um, indicate whether someone was uh, foreign born. So you could see how many foreign born people 
that doesn't necessarily tell you their citizenship because some people could be foreign born but US citizens. But what you see in the early 20th century is that um, there was a disproportionate number of foreign born people, especially in mental hospitals. And one of the chapters focuses on this. And so you have to ask yourself in New York City, it was upwards of 80% of the people in the state mental hospitals were uh, foreign born. How were they ending up there? We, it's hard to imagine that that rate of mental illness was just so much higher amongst the foreign born. Um, so one explanation is that either limited language skills or the lack of cultural understanding that people were simply picked up for behaving in ways which were seen as non-normative and put into these mental hospitals. And so you could kind of track those numbers. And this is really important to think about because right now in places like California and Portland and New York, uh, the leaders, you know, these are all democratic leaders are calling for increased civil commitment of people with mental illness. Um, and so I fear sort of a re-emergence of what happened in the early 20th century when the vast majority of people were not locked up in jails and prisons, but instead in mental hospitals that we're going to sort of, as as we've made some progress on decarceration from jails and prisons, particularly in California, that this is kind of the back door towards mass incarceration. That's fascinating I and so important. I just wanna add another like a footnote, which is this kind of nefarious way in which apportionment and the census and imprisonment work together, where I think currently, I don't know, historically people are counted as where they're imprisoned and so, and we know apportionment, you know, in terms of how many uh, representatives are sent to Congress is based on population. And so we have a situation where we have these, you know, oftentimes rural towns where the population is greatly swelled by people who are incarcerated, who are primarily black and brown, often who cannot vote themselves because of felony disenfranchisement, but then their body is counting for purposes of, having you know more members in congress right so it's 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 horribly reminiscent of this you know idea of you know people who are enslaved as counting as three-fifths of a person but not counting as as people who can vote um anyway so i just wanted to put that out there yeah and in, um, in, or in oregon where i am um the highest concentration of black people in the state is in salem and if you know salem it's not a particularly black town and the reason for that is that's where the the state prison is. So that's why they have the highest concentration. So it's, yeah, it's kind of grim. So grim. Um, okay, I have a question from Aida Rogers. Um, I'm interested in how US foreign policy interests have shaped who has been deemed worthy of entry. It is interesting that white Cubans were granted parole quickly in the 1980s, whereas Haitians and black Cubans who perhaps immigration officials thought were Haitian, face longer and at times indefinite detention, as you mentioned in the introduction to your book. Uh, what accounts for this discrepancy beyond the recognizable racial dimension? Do refugees and immigrants coming from enemy states, uh, quote unquote, uh, like Cuba receive different treatment? If so, how is it different? Why is this the case? Yeah, so um, I was just talking about this in an immigration asylum law class today the history of sort of refugee acceptances is intimately tied up with US foreign policy. So after the Vietnam War, large numbers of um, Vietnamese came into the United States as refugees. After World War II, there were large numbers of Europeans from Eastern Europe um, who were brought in to the United States and allowed in. But then if we see the more recent wars, Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, or after the following the genocide in Rwanda, um, very few refugees were actually allowed in after those, um, after those conflicts. So foreign policy does have a lot to do with it, it especially in the past, um, after World War II, it was almost entirely people fleeing from communist countries. And that's where the Cuban um, refugee streams were, you know, there's a whole complete 
different set of laws for Cuban refugees, the uh, Cuban Adjustment Act, which allows them to legalize their status after a year. Although Obama changed the law to make it harder now if you just come in across the border. So more Cubans are being incarcerated now and lined up for deportation. Although um, those deport Cuba has not yet accepted those people. So they're finding themselves yet again in these conditions of indefinite detention pending their deportation. So the book, um, in one of the chapters talks about the case of the Mariel Cubans who come in the 1980s, 125,000 Cubans come in. They're, that group was disproportionately black and poorer than the group that came in in the 1960s who were whiter Cubans. And although the vast majority of them were paroled, the ones who were paroled and allowed to join their families were people who had family ties. So the whiter Cubans, the ones who remained in prison because they were caught on say a marijuana possession charge and then ordered deported tended to be darker skinned. And so by the time you get to late 1980s, you have thousands of uh, black Cubans imprisoned pending deportation who had been in prison for years, sometimes up to a decade and essentially facing indefinite detention. And that leads to a prison uprising where they seize uh, Atlanta Penitentiary and a, a detention center in Oakdale, Louisiana for two weeks. It's the longest lasting prison uprising in US history. And it's a fascinating story, um, but definitely foreign policy and, and race, racism um, are key to understanding sort of how different, why different groups are let in. The other factor, is whether there is within the United States an advocacy group for that particular um, uh, group. So uh, Jews during the uh, 1980s, uh, the so-called refuseniks um, had advocacy within the United States. So large numbers of those uh, people um, coming out of the Soviet Union were allowed in. Um, other groups who don't have uh, significant advocacy within the U.S. simply aren't allowed in. Thank you. Super informative. Um, I'm going to read another question uh, from Gregory Chan. Have you connected the work done by Jean Felser in her book, Driven Out, the Forgotten War Against Chinese Americans, such as the more than 200 roundups, quote unquote, that occurred in California between 1849 and 1906, not to mention the purges in Washington and Oregon. We could also mention here uh, Beth Blue Williams's work, I suppose. Yeah, both of those are amazing um, historical accounts of that the anti-Chinese pogroms which occurred along the entire West Coast in the 1880s. And it's really what gives rise to McNeil Island because the government is responding to this populist upsurge against, against the Chinese and the demand um, by people to enforce this Immigration Restriction Act, which had been in place since 1882, but people saw Chinese coming in. And so then that leads to them, okay, we're gonna find the people who are in the country unlawfully, put them in prison um, and deport them. And so all of that, um, context uh, um, or that those uh, purges are the context for the legal remedy. And so basically the state steps in to do what the mob does, but to do it through the law. Um, but essentially they um, have the same ends, which is getting rid of eliminating Chinese uh, from the United States. Another question uh, that came in from Jacqueline Messiani, are there any editions of the Island Lantern available digi digitally or on the web? Um, I don't believe so. This is, uh, I've been going up to the National Archives in Seattle um, is where I found the, um, that, that it's a prison magazine that was published by the uh, the incarcerated people themselves. So it's really interesting to see, obviously, the 
what got out. It was highly, I'm sure, controlled what information got out. But there's a whole, um, there are databases of uh, prison newspapers, and there's a long history of prison newspapers, including a uh, really famous one from the Angola prison, Louisiana, the Angolite, which has been digitized. Um, I don't think this uh, Island Lantern one has, so you'd need to make your way up to the Seattle National Archives, <laughs> dig through paper. Um, so I have another question for you, which is like, why is there amnesia, right? When, I mean, this history in some ways makes such a compelling case that the prototypical quote unquote illegal immigrant is Chinese. Like, like why is this not, why, why is the Chinese person not centered uh, in that uh, imagination of like, you know, and I don't know if this has to do with what the historian May Nye describes with the kind of raising of the border and the era of national origins quotas and the construction of the racialization of who is um, the quote unquote illegal immigrant kind of eclipsing this history or does this have to do with assumptions about Chinese immigrants as, as quote unquote alien but not illegal? I, I, I'm just fascinated to hear if you have thoughts yeah. about this. Yeah, I think what happens is that the, you know, after the 1930s, the Mexican becomes the new image of the illegal alien. Um, and so that, it, till today, people think about that as the illegal alien. And even in this fight against 1326, the, against the illegal reentry charge, the lawyers have decided to go back to the 1929 charge, which, and the argument is this is based on anti-Mexican racism. I don't understand why they don't go back to 1880, the 1880s, because it's the same criminalization that happened in the 1880s, but it's against the Chinese. Um, I think there is absolutely a kind of amnesia. I'm not sure if it has to, something to do with you know, the model minority myth and this idea of the Chinese as, as being sort of now in a separate category from other, um, and Asians in general from other immigrants. But, um, but I definitely, you know, the history is very clear that the original group against whom all of these laws were created, all of these ideas of the illegal alien as May Nai, you know, shows so well is, is the Chinese originally. And then that later gets extended to these, these other groups. And I think it just, helps to show um, in terms of this court case, the racism, because there's nothing more clear than the Chinese Exclusion Act as being a, a law based in racial animus. That's so interesting. Um, I have more thoughts about this that I will make, uh, tell you outside of the public uh, webinar. Um, I mean, one thing that's really special speaking to you from Berkeley Law is that the Dean of the law school here did the oral argument in the before the Ninth Circuit, um, oh. December. So you know, many of us are are thinking a lot about um, that case and and eagerly or not eagerly <laughs> awaiting uh, the outcome. So, um, but yeah, it's I mean, and it's to me this amazing uh, story about for um, people who are in the legal space, how to work with historians uh, and how historical research can inform. Uh, contemporary legal argument and how important it is to know history, right? And how history is forgotten and how history can resurface and shape how we understand a law that's impacting, you know, thousands and thousands of people today. Um, anyway, this was absolutely invaluable. Um, so appreciative of your time with us um, in this um, forum. And I wanna thank you very, very much, um, Professor Elliot Young for speaking with us today. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. And thanks for all the great questions. It's always great um, to engage with this material and, and hear other people engage with it as well. So thank you for participating. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.